The reading is taken from Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 to 17. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, our subject this lunchtime is equality and power. And I want us to see that that which John Lennon asked us to imagine all the people living life as one, that which the world in union or Martin Luther King or the feminist movement in its deepest desires seeks, that which we all long for, that our HR departments, diversity departments have as their agenda, that it has been realized in and through the work of Jesus Christ. I want us to see that the hope, the only hope for peaceful, harmonious union for humanity is to be found in Jesus and Jesus alone. The first single I ever purchased was back in the 1960s. I think it was the 60s, maybe the early 70s. It just beat Thank You Very Much by The Scaffold. The first single was uh, I Want to Teach the World to Sing in Perfect Harmony by The Seekers. It's utterly cringeworthy. But since then, I have stood variously on the Berlin Wall separating East and West, on the barriers of the Springfield Road, Falls Road, separating Protestant and Catholic on the great 12-foot, 18-foot high barbed wire fences dividing the northern territories of Hong Kong from mainland China, on the Great Wall of China in Jerusalem with those wretched divides. All over the world, down through history, division, whether on religious or ethnic or social or racial grounds. And today I wanted to see that that which globalization and multiculturalism, the League of Nations, the United Nations seeks to achieve, it has all been realized in and through the person of Jesus Christ. The issue has to do with identity and power. And the key part of the passage we're going to be looking at is verses 10 and 11, where Paul writes, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. So then the Christian person no longer sees themselves as primarily French or English or primarily black or white or primarily Asian or African or rich or poor or educated or uneducated. No, the Christian person sees themselves as Christian first and foremost. Christ is all and in all. Now, the reason Paul writes these verses is because a super-religious, super-strict sect had infiltrated a church 
and were seeking to promote various religious cultural practices in place of the plain pursuit of Jesus. And inevitably, that divides and drives people apart. And so Paul takes all the greatest social and religious dividers of his day, Jew, Greek, circumcision, uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. And he says, no, you are all one in Christ. You've put on a new humanity in Christ. Those default dividing walls have been smashed in Christ. How dare you start to identify as white or Jewish or upper class or educated? Now, before we go any further, we need to grasp that this is not so simplistic as an eradication of all differences and every hierarchy. Later in the letter, Paul recognizes household servants. He doesn't tell them to overthrow the system. And later in the letter, Paul addressed his masters at work and elsewhere, the wealthy, and he never tells them to renounce their position. Jesus and Paul recognize rank and order, power and authority. There will be hierarchy in heaven. So this is not some kind of simplistic socialist system or Marxist state. Christianity is not communism. Rather, what we're being shown is a new community in which that which we all long for in terms of equality and love and kindness and compassion has been realized in Christ. So we're going to begin in verses 10 and 11, and we'll see then how it is worked out in verses 12 and through 17. But first, verse 10, the new humanity recreated in Christ. We'll take it from verse 9. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put on, put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Paul is urging his readers to new conduct on the basis of what Jesus has made us. The new self there is literally the new man. Paul is referring to what he has already taught earlier in the letter about the work of Jesus. So we need to just push back a bit. And I think it's summarized perhaps best in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2. You have been buried with Christ in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So the Christian believer, through faith in Jesus, has been united to the finished work of Christ and has been made completely new in Jesus. This is a supernatural work wrought in the Christian person by God who is now a new creation. Once dead to God, now alive in Christ. Once with a record of debt standing against us, now cleared. Once cut off from God, now united with God. Once under the domain of darkness, separated from God, now in the kingdom of light, at one with God. And so the language is of the Christian person having been recreated. <laughs> the Christian person having been made completely new. The Christian person having been raised from an old life, separated from God, raised to new life, in Christ, with God indwelling us, the past white clean, the future secured, the present indwelt, seated with Christ. Now, this doesn't capture the point properly, and it's thoroughly inadequate, but if you've ever seen the snake shedding its skin and emerging from the process made new, 
Or if you've ever witnessed the butterfly emerging from the chrysalis, the Christian person has been recreated. It's a new humanity. The Christian person has been brought alive. And just as in the original creation, God formed humanity from the dust and breathed life into humanity, so in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, the broken old humanity has been recreated and reformed with new life from God breathed into us. We are entirely new beings. Notice, this is not theoretical. Christianity is not a philosophy. And this is not imaginary or fanciful. Jesus is real. His resurrection happened. And his Holy Spirit today breaks into a person's life, bringing life from God. It is a recreation. It's not something from below. It's something from above. It's not self-help or self-actualization. God has done it. It's not external to the, to the individual, some sort of ritualized, institutionalized religion, some program. It is God himself who has broken in and made the Christian person new. You have put on the new self. But do you notice from verse 10, having put on the new self... The new self is now renewed, it's an ongoing process, in knowledge, it's renewed after what we're shown in Jesus Christ, and it's renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And the creator, of course, is Jesus. He is supreme over this creation. We've seen that. And so day by day, the new me is being made new as a result of the truth that the Lord Jesus has made known in the Christian gospel. And so just as Jesus made everybody and died for everybody and offers amnesty to everybody, forgiveness and a fresh start, bringing people from every nation, language, tribe, and tongue from darkness into light. So there is now no Jew, no Greek. There is neither circumcised nor uncircumcised, neither barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. We have been born completely new. And all the wretched divisions that we so rightly hate, they have been done away with in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wish we were here, all of us together, in St. Helens at the moment. We'd be able to see, seated down here, a CEO. Seated over here, a secretary. Seated over there, somebody who's been brought up in Nigeria. Seated over there, somebody who's come from Newcastle. Somebody who's been educated at top private school, gone on to Oxbridge, and then formed in one of the top six law companies. And somebody else who's come from the most run-down estate or comprehensive or whatever it happens to be all one in Christ Jesus, a new creation with the old divisions gone. Let's be in no doubt how radical this is. Paul is saying, how dare you bring back into the church these divisions through your super strict, super spiritual, uh, super religious additions to the Christian faith. This new humanity, of course, of recreated individuals creates a new community united in Christ. And so, verse 11, there is no Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. Christ is all and in all. Now, by mentioning these groups, Jew, Greek, and so forth, Paul is charting the great divisions of first century society. Greek culture was the prevailing culture of the so-called civilized world in the first century. And though the Romans now ruled the roost, Greek language and Greek education continued to dominate. And if you were kind of civilized or educated, you spoke Greek. Just like uh, in medieval England, you spoke Latin and across the whole of Europe. 
The Jew was the other great culture of first century civilization with all its history and antiquity, patterns of behavior and religion. And the Jews quite understandably held themselves morally as a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, teachers of the ignorant. And by the blind, those in darkness and the ignorant, they meant non-Jews. The Jews had the law from God, the creator, to show them how to live. And this social cultural divide between Greek and Jew was cemented, or should I say sliced, in the religious practice of circumcision. For circumcision was the mark of the Jew. It wasn't simply that one had a piece of skin removed. It was that one committed to a whole way of life under circumcision. And the pious Jew thanked God every morning that he had not been born a Gentile or a Greek. The barbarian was everybody else. Educated Greeks referred to everybody who could not speak Greek as barbarians. And the Scythians were the most barbarian of the barbarians. They were a group of tribes on the Baltic Sea. Josephus, the Jewish historian, described Scythians as, quote, little better than wild beasts. Slaves made up a vast proportion of the working population of the first century, and free men were those who had sufficient resources to work and survive without bonding themselves in slavery. Now, for people from across these divisions to exist together in perfect harmony, it was unthinkable, as unthinkable as Palestinian and Israeli or Catholic and Protestant. These were massive divides in the ancient world, historic divisions, social divisions, cultural divisions, racial divisions, ethnic divisions, religious divisions, educational divisions. It just couldn't happen. But Paul insists that in and through Jesus, is, it has. That those who trust in the Lord Jesus have died with Jesus. And those who trust in the Lord Jesus have put self to death on the cross with Jesus. And those who trust in the Lord Jesus through the regenerative work of Jesus have risen to new life in Jesus. And so just as Jesus made everybody and died for everybody and has offered amnesty to everybody, so every individual from whatever background who's been brought as a new creation, rising, if you like, from the chrysalis into the dominion and kingdom of Jesus, everybody is equal as one in this one new humanity. Here, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither circumcised nor uncircumcised, neither barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Now, I'm well aware that in the church, in the name of Jesus, many of these distinctions have been justified, even promoted on the basis of false teaching of Jesus and this is something for which, false presentation of the teaching of Jesus, this is something of which the church should be deeply ashamed. Here is just a small example down in Ashburnham where we often go for our summer partnership summer school. Uh, the family who owned Ashburnham had their own pew in the chapel, which was part of the estate, separated from everybody else. They sat completely separated with their own door into the chapel so they didn't have to mix with the estate workers. My father, who was brought up in Sri Lanka on a tea estate, tells me that the Sri Lankan workers had a completely separate service to all those uh, who were running the estate. And these are things which, of which the church should be profoundly ashamed and we can see from these verses that to justify that kind of thing is in direct contradiction with the teaching of the Bible. Lovely story. A young lad coming from a small prep school uh, came home at the end of his first term and said, Mum, do you know something extraordinary happens in chapel? The headmaster, who incidentally was a very clear Christian, has told us and insisted that we are not to stand up when he comes into chapel nor are we to call him sir when he comes into chapel. 
because he says, we're all one here. And the little boy was astounded. In the church, all historic distinctions and differences have been radically eradicated. Oh, you white man, you are no longer to consider yourself fundamentally as a white man. Oh, you educated man, you're no longer to consider yourself fundamentally as an educated man. Oh, you aristocratic man, you're no longer to consider yourself part of the privileged elite. You are one in Christ. The old you is now dead, and you've been brought into one new humanity. Now, is this not beautiful? And isn't it what we long for? And is it not right? And in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, and only in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, it is possible. Now, at this point, I was going to push forward into verses 12 to 17. We've seen the new humanity in Christ, verse 10. We've seen the new community in Christ, verse 11. And then the new activity of the Christian community clothed in Christ. And in verses 12 through 17, we see the love that glues, the peace that governs, and the word that guides. But really, it's a description of the life and activity and work of Jesus. You are being renewed in knowledge after the image of the Creator. And so verse 12, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving, and above all, putting on love. That is Jesus that you're putting on in this new community. We are, of course, drawn to such a community. We long for the kind of world which G John Lennon asked us to imagine. One solution to such divisions and injustices is today being put forward by the proponents of what is known as identity politics. Identity politics has its roots in the teachings of the philosopher Michel Foucault. Foucault argued that human beliefs were primarily shaped by the dynamics of power and not primarily by truth. These power dynamics have resulted in marginalized and discriminated against groups, women, those of particular sexual orientations, black people, and so forth. And the task of the good in a culture is to overthrow the historic centers of power. And anyone seeking to maintain them is perpetuating violence and should be mercilessly shut down. Now, in identity politics, these distinct groups, women, the gay, bi, and transsexual community, people of color, come together in what is known as intersectionality with the goal of overthrowing historic power bases. Now, there is much in Foucault's teaching that is true. Human beliefs really have been shaped frequently by dynamics of power and not of truth. In the church, to our shame, that has been the case. But you will have noticed, as I have, that all the tactics and language of these identity groups is ultimately itself clothed in the dress of power. So go on to any feminist website and you will discover that they want power. Or indeed, onto the website of Black Lives Matter, where you'll find so much that is good, you will nonetheless find the language of power. And so inevitably, the politics of identity, the intersectionality that they are pursuing is profoundly divisive as it sets one group against another group, against another group, against another group. And the politics of identity, as it's worked out by human beings, fails because it fails to deal with the fundamental issue, the problem with humanity and our exercise of power. What is needed is not some new identity group power base over here or another identity group power base over there and overthrowing that power base only to establish another power base. That misses the point completely. It does not address the fundamental issue with humanity. We need a new creation, a new humanity that is being renewed 
after the image of its creator, and the image of its creator is an image of compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiveness, peacemaking, and above all, love. Just look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly, another solution to the problems of division amongst humanity is put forward by writers such as Jordan Peterson and Douglas Murray. A recent lecture by Peterson, which I listened to just the other day, he argued that the solution was to go back to the centrality of the individual, which he suggests is what the Enlightenment really gave to us. But think about it. If we go back to the centrality of the individual, all we've got is endless individuals. We haven't dealt with the fundamental issue of humanity. We're not bringing humanity together. Rather, we're existing in individual boxes. And what is needed is a recreation, a whole new humanity. And Paul says, in Jesus, and in Jesus alone, who has died, who has risen, who has dealt with the problem of our sin, given us new life, and enabled us to be recreated as individuals, we find it. So if we come from a black background and we're people of color, Christ has recreated us. The old you has died. A new self has been brought out from the grave. You are a new being. We are all equal in Christ. And if we come from a white background, we can't deny that in this country we've been born with extraordinary advantages in this culture. But the old you has died. You have recognized that you are fundamentally dead in your sin. You've been brought to new life and you are on an absolute equal basis with any other individual. If we come from a Jewish culture or a Muslim culture or a secularist or a humanist culture, we have been recreated in Christ. We are a new humanity. All those divisions are gone. The old self has been shed. The new humanity has arisen. And the new humanity is being renewed day by day by day in knowledge after the image of its creator. And that image is seen in the person of Christ. How dare anybody bring fresh divisions back into the church of Christ? Well, there's much to discuss following just these two verses, and I'd encourage us to do that. But I hope we can see that it's only in Jesus that these divisions are done away with. He and he alone knows how to exercise power. The way he exercised power was to take on the form of a slave, to come into this world, to shed all his deserved power as creator of the universe, and as a slave to serve men and women like you and me. There is the new man that we are to put on day by day. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, how we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, being in very nature God. He did not use his equality with God for his own benefit. But he'd entered into this world to go to a cross to serve us and to make us new. Please help us as we seek to encourage one another to put on the new man day by day by day, to be people of selfless kindness, compassion, peace, love for your namesake. Amen. Well, we've already got some great questions coming in. There's so much to talk about here. This first one, very helpful kind words about uh, this lunchtime and so forth, but I can't help feeling that this passage might speak into the way we do church at St. Helens. For example, should we be convicted that we have a more youthful congregation at six o'clock and a specific Chinese congregation at 2.30? Should we not all mix together as brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, the answer is yes, that is where we're headed. But of course, we have to recognize that the world as it is as a result of our human sin, is divided. And so the intention is not to 
end with every Christian person who comes into a Mandarin-speaking congregation uh, with only ever that person being in a Mandarin-speaking congregation for the rest of their life. No, we're wanting to bring people as they come to Christ into the full body and full experience of what it is to be part of the Christian community here at St. Helens. But in order to try and reach people uh, from backgrounds where they simply don't speak English, um, for the Mandarin congregation, or where perhaps the idea of mixing with people of these different ages and stages of life would be anathema to them, we deliberately have congregations to try and reach people like that, to teach them Christ, and then to see them integrated into the body of the Christian church. So that's why it is as it is. Um, interestingly, Henry, who runs the Mandarin congregation here at 2.30, insists that it's 2.30, not 10.30, so that those people in the Mandarin congregation, as they grow in Christ and come to understand English better, are able to be part of the 1030 congregation. Come to any one of our services, you will find that we are ethnically very, very mixed indeed. Uh, a lot of people operate with kind of caricatures of St. Helens taken from 30 or 40 years ago. In verse 14, what does it look like for us to practice love with each other? What does perfect harmony look like in the church? What I really like uh, about verse 9, I think it's the whole picture is a beautiful picture of Jesus uh, as we put on the new self. Verse 9 is a striking verse. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put, on, put off the old self. Truth is right at the heart of this community. And given the particular issue of uh, the Black Lives Matter um, uh, and concerns that have really troubled so many of us just over these last weeks. Truth is absolutely key in this, isn't it? And so to, to, to take the question particularly to that issue, I think it will be speaking truth to one another, actually being bold enough to say, well, we are one in Christ. And asking my black sister, my black brother, well, what does it feel like? How has this impacted you? I think sometimes we fail to realize that we are one in Christ, and so we kind of just skirt past issues where we actually ought to bring truth to the front and ask people, how does it, how does it actually feel to be living through what we're going through in our culture just at the moment? So, I mean, any, any number of things. Uh, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. It is recognizing that we have been forgiven by Christ. We have been reconciled to God, and therefore allowing that reconciliation to rule. It's interesting, isn't it? Let it rule in your heart. So I will not allow myself to be driven apart from my Christian brother and sister. Let the peace of Christ rule. And love, above all, put on love. It will mean forgiveness, won't it? It will mean thinking, how can I help and serve this Christian brother, regardless of where they come from or how we might have been divided uh, before I was a Christian. Given that our primary identity is in Christ, what is a wise way to respond to those who call themselves Christian feminists or Christian socialists or Christian doctors even? Well, I always want to ask, the, ask myself, well, are you actually Christian? I.e., where Christianity challenges your socialism or your capitalism or your feminism, uh, where it challenges, are you prepared to change? I think the fundamental place it challenges the feminist issue is on the issue of power. Uh, and there is a real challenge there. But uh, I think we're out of time. So I'm going to pause there. I've just seen the flashing light. And I'm going to lead us in prayer. And then we will um, go into groups. I think there are groups afterwards if you'd like to be part of one. Let's pray. Above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We praise you, Father, for the love of Christ, his selfless, sacrificial love for us. Please would you help us as we look to Christ and to his truth to be renewed in knowledge after his image. Would you please help us to grasp his love more deeply, to see its breadth, and depth and height and length to see just how much he loved us and what it meant for him in selfless, meek humility.
to give himself in love to us. And may this love be written deep into our life together. In Jesus' name, amen.